That carpenter will start a kingdom of the heart. Want to welcome you guys this morning, the sturdy disciples of Jesus Christ. Man, battling the weather. Snow, this is no stinking snowstorm. I'll tell you what, it is always so good to come together. We missed being together last week, but we said, no, we shall not give in to this storm. Uh, hopefully you guys obviously got here safely, and uh, you know, just for the record, uh, whenever something like this happens, please use the better part of discretion and, um, and be safe. And uh, we're gonna work out if uh, in the future when something happens, we're gonna be able to sit in our homes and uh, have maybe a communion message uh, and, uh, and to be able to have a contingency plan there nonetheless. But it is good to be with everyone. Um, when we were in San Antonio, no one told us about this. I feel I've been had, I've been took, I've been bamboozled. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's so good to be with everyone. And uh, last night, actually, Melly and I had a chance to drive to uh, Montreal and uh, to meet with the church. They want to share a little bit with you what's going on there. It is simply inspiring. The church began the year on a 21-day fast. And, uh, of course, uh, given people's uh, health situations or whatever, uh, there, people have fasted from a, a, a number of things. And it culminated yesterday with a solemn assembly. And uh, the leaders of the church there, Stanley and Dominique, asked uh, me to come and uh, preach uh, last night. And to say it was inspiring would be an understatement. As literally the entire church gathered from 7 till midnight, and they worshiped the Lord, they heard the word of God uh, uh, preached, they confessed their sins with so many tears and, and, and so much joy as, uh, as they embark uh, on this new journey that they're on, as they have rendered their, gar uh, their garments, and not, uh, they rendered their hearts and not their garments, as they've given their lives over to God, it was simply, simply phenomenal. And I, I tell Stanley, uh, we, uh, I'm watching very carefully because uh, I want to learn from what's going on there and to see what God is doing. And so we went there. It started at 7 in the evening. Uh, we drove back uh, after uh, we were there for a little bit. So it was just really, really awe-inspiring. Didn't quite to get to see all of Quebec because it was in the night, but that's all right. Uh, we'll, we'll go back again. Um, it felt odd to be in Canadian's territory. I mean, as a Maple Leaf fan, I mean, it was kind of hard. I had to pray a lot, but the Lord, the Lord saw me through it, amen. We're continuing our series, The Epic Battles of the Scriptures. We've chosen 10 epic battles. And uh, this, the last week, well, two weeks ago, we spoke about David and Goliath and how God, with one arm, and with one stone slew the giant Goliath. And we talked about how obviously that that was a type of Christ and how ultimately Christ wins the victory for us. And how all the stories in the Old Testament points towards Jesus and him dying on the cross for our sins. And so the, today we're going to talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm sure you've heard a lot about these guys your Sunday school stories or people have referred to them. We actually, even you may have noticed, we sang one of the songs, right, that, that, that sang about those things. And so my, one of my goals is that as we study the Word of God and as we sing these songs, uh, even though there are a little bit of reference, we don't understand exactly. And so I've entitled this sermon, Faith on Fire. And you'll understand that a little bit more even as we read. So if you would, turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. After we were, I saw all the songs that we were planning, I was wondering, I asked uh, Dwayne, am I going to have a chance to come on up here? <laughs> and he said, yes, five to six minutes you have. You make the most of it. Amen. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. 
In the third year, in the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon advanced against Jerusalem and laid it under siege. Let's stop there for a second. One of the things I love about the Bible is it does some things that roots it in history. And so the stories that are said here or the recollections are not just some things that are pulled out of thin air. And like we said, one of the things about this congregation is that we are a congregation that's going to worship God not only with our heart, but also with our minds. And so we understand what is going on. One of the things that we're doing in this epic series is not only are we telling these stories as great as these stories are, we're going to get a little bit more acquainted with the scriptures and understand because context is everything. I'm going to say a statement here. A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. And so what that is a roundabout way of saying if we don't understand the context of something, we can make a text say whatever we would like for it to say, to just simply prove our point. But we are not in this church that we're about to prove some kind of great point that we have. But we want to point towards our God in heaven. And so one of the things that we got to understand is the context of what is going on. We will understand the scriptures a lot more when we understand the context of this. And we can read the story. This is a standalone story in a manner of speaking that we can understand, yes, some attributes about God and how powerful God is, but I think we will be better served in deepen our faith a little bit more when we understand context. And so the idea here of what's going on, it's talking about Jehoiakim, the king of Judah. A little bit of context. You remember that uh, Israel's first king was Saul? No, you don't. Because Israel's first king was who? God. Israel's first king, human king, was Saul. Trick. I do that. Sorry about that. I apologize. And of course, David, after Saul was defeated, and, and, and one of the most sober statements in the scriptures, the Bible tells us that God left, his spirit left Saul. David was anointed king. He became king of Israel, and it was a glorious time in God's kingdom. Eighty years later, shortly after, even God, God warned them what would happen if they chose a human king. As a matter of fact, when Ch Israel chose uh, Saul as their king, God said, oh, they've not rejected you, Samuel. They have rejected me as king. And that was a sober statement. And yet we see that God, in his mercy, allowed Israel to gloriously be a nation. But 80 years later, the kingdom of Israel divided. It divided into 12 tribes. And it divided also into a northern and southern kingdom of which there were 10 tribes and then there were two tribes. And shortly after this, what was a, an incredible victory after victory after victory as, as David was winning victories upon victories, it was a sobering time because the kingdom got divided. It's amazing. It's amazing how human beings can become so divided rather quickly. When pride, when self-promotion, when wanting to be the greatest. And oftentimes, that is a mark on Christianity. A lot of people refuse to enter God's kingdom because of the dividedness that is found on ridiculous issues. And Satan must laugh. Nonetheless, 
This has been a mark of God's people literally throughout history. And so about 935 BC, the kingdom is divided. And now the only kingdom that is staying faithful to God is Judah. And yet Judah too has strayed from God. And Jeremiah and Daniel are contemporaries. I want to help you guys understand that, okay? They are at the same time. They're preaching, they're talking, and Jeremiah warns the people of God. You should read it sometime. He warns the people of God that they have rebelled against God and that there are serious repercussions when we turn our back on God. I'm always reticent when people describe today's world as, man, it's getting worse and worse. I'm not convinced. Have you read the scriptures? <laughs> Do you understand God's people? Do you understand people in general? I'm not saying it's heaven and earth by no means. But hearts of people were exposed and, and God in his mercy and his grace would send prophet upon prophet to warn people, to talk to them. Listen, you've got to turn your ways and turn towards God. And warning upon warning upon warnings. And what God does is quite remarkable. We pick it up in verse 2. That I mean, I literally could preach for five hours on that and talk a little bit about how that is, how it's set in history. And we can go back and understand the times a little bit more. So what you've got to understand now, so what happens is God uses Babylon to discipline Israel. You, some interesting words are going to be used. Look in verse 2. It says, Now the Lord delivered King Jehoiakim of Judah into, the, into his power, that is Nebuchadnezzar, along with some of the vessels of the temple of God. He brought them to the land of Babylonia, to the temple of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. And so what happens is that God uses the king of Babylon, in this case, Nebuchadnezzar, and they captured Judah. God had warned them of this. He said, listen, unless you change and repent, I'm going to hand you over to a peoples that is going to treat you with such disregard. The idea was not for discipline. It was not for retributive discipline or punishment, but rather it was for remedial discipline. I'll explain the difference in a second. One is when you do something simply and you are going to be punished because you, you did it. Another one, they are disciplined so that you can change. You understand? One is simply a, a justice, if you would, a punishment that meets the criteria for the crime you committed. Remedial discipline is about the goal is to ultimately to help you to get better. And that's God's heart throughout the scriptures. When people misunderstand, they say, well, God is just angry. No, God is helping us to understand, listen, when are you going to straighten out the ways that you live your life? I'm going to correct you. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to rebuke you, and sometimes I am going, after you're not listening to me over and over and over again, I am going to have to discipline you. And so that's what's going on here. So that's the context, okay? So the, the uh, king of Babylon has now captured all the Israelites. They have, they have now not only uh, complete capturing, not only means that they, that city has been defeated, but now its utensils, its vessels, its treasury have now come onto the king of Babylonia. That is total annihilation. 
total subjection. And so that's what's happening here. Jeremiah is preaching about this is what's going to happen. And of course, this is exactly what happens. And so we read, we continue to read. The king commanded Ashpenaz, who was in charge of his court officials, to choose some of the Israelites who were of noble and royal descent. <coughs> Young men in whom there was no physical defect and who were handsome. Well versed in all kinds of wisdom, well educated, and having keen insight who were capable of entering the king's royal service and to teach them the literature and language of the Babylonians. So the king assigned them a daily ration from his daily del royal delicacies and from the wine he drank himself. They were to be trained for the next three years. At the end of that time, they were to enter the king's service. So what's happening here? So they, they captured the, 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 the Israelites. And the king of Babylon says, OK, we want the best of the best, so to speak. And we want them to come and serve in my courts. Not only do I want them to come and serve in my courts, I want them to be trained properly. Scripture tells us there was going to be three years of training that was going to take place in order for them to be qualified to serve on the king's court. And so then they were given some food. They said, okay, not only are we going to train these guys, we're actually going to feed them. And we're going to make sure that they're healthy. You know, it's a lot what happens with, uh, with a lot of schooling now with, with doctors and and, and, and dentists, people, especially in the medical field, the, the, the colleges or the universities actually lose money with these people who come in, meaning they don't pay for all the money that they spend in college. It's a loss. The whole idea, ultimately, is that these people would come out and be productive members of society. And that's one of the things why when you're in medical school, unless you're an absolute derelict, they don't want you to fail. They're investing in you so that you can come out and really be a contributing member of society. Really, same concept here. It's a, hey, listen, we're going to invest in you. We're going to make sure that you get the right kinds of food, that you make sure that you have the right living so that at the end of three years, you're going to be able, it's not going to be a waste of time. That's why it burns my heart when people who have been disciples for a while, for whatever reason, walk away from their faith. After all that we have learned, after all that God has invested in you and God has invested in me. You know, I've been a Christian now for 32 years. And this is my family, warts and all. Some are bigger warts than others, but I'm not, I'm not going to say Granville is one of those. Like, I'm not going, I did not say that. You understood that that's what I said, right? This is my family. To give up after 32 years is absolute madness. Am I going to fight the challenges in my life with or without God? It just seems obvious I would fight it with God. And then with people that I love around me, I mean, that just makes sense. But sometimes when, you, when you're growing insane spiritually, you make stupid decisions. And if you don't have people in your life to point you in the right direction, then we too will fall prey to that. And so the king was training these young men. And we find out, it says there in verse 6, as it turned out, these young men were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But the overseer of the court officials renamed them. He gave them Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, Hananiah, he named Shadrach, Mishael, he named Meshach, and Azariah, he named Abednego. I always wondered, when I read the scriptures, why do we say Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That's not the pattern here, right? It's 
Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Right? We, we gotta, if we're going to write name it the right way, we ought to name it the right way. So, long story short, that's why we give you guys the, the things to, to read the scriptures. Uh, these guys said, hey, listen, we don't want to defile ourselves with the king's delicacies. We are going to have our own meal. The guy who was in charge of these guys said, hey, listen, you lost your mind. Do you know my responsibility? It is to make sure that you guys don't fail. So you better eat the proper food. Daniel says, okay, let's put a test. And this is the test. Just give me 10 days. Give me 10 days and let's see the diet that I'm suggesting, whether or not it is going to be better than the diet that you're giving me. I know, court official, you got a good heart. But I'm afraid you're not quite understanding who my God is. You will find throughout the scriptures that God is yearning for us. To say, trust me. I know it doesn't seem reasonable all the time to your mind. But trust me. Trust when I say. That if you live an immoral life. that ultimately it doesn't benefit you. Trust me when I say that if we run after gold or silver or education, if we're merely trying to impress people, trust me, it's a losing battle. Trust me when I say jealousy and envy. Trust me when I say when we're just simply contrarians and we cause factions and dissensions. Trust me, these things do not benefit you. Trust me when we look at someone lustfully, we've committed adultery. Trust me when we're angry with someone. It's like you've murdered them. That's what the scripture says. Trust me, love is the answer. And yet there are times we, with our mouth, I know this because I do it. I say, yes, yes, that sounds so good. And we use God and his words as a punchline. Because it sounds good. And yet to absolute obedience. It's a foreign concept. We find it difficult. And we look at our world and, and sometimes we chase what our neighbors are chasing because they look happy. Man, if the world was like Facebook, we would think this was heaven on earth. Everybody looks so happy. They're on a nice vacation and everything in the world is going right except for a few but for the most part, we will think, man, wow, we have solved the world's problems. And all you've got to do is talk to that person. You realize that does not represent reality. Facebook should be renamed Facade. Because <laughs> that's what it's all about. And God, over and over and over and over again, he says, trust me, live according to my word and watch what happens. Trust in my promises. And that's all he asked the Israelites when they escaped Egypt. He says, trust me as your God. And of course, what happened? They went and chased after other gods. And so we've got to see that, man, God's saying, this doesn't have to be a long test. Ten days. 
Is there something in your life right now that you're grappling with? And you're wondering, man, which way should I go? Mikhail didn't understand grappled. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to learn French that eventually I'm going to do both. I'm going to preach in both languages. Amen. So pray for me. Amen. But is there something right now? I mean, I remember growing up before I became a Christian. I thought if I got the right go girl, man, that was going to solve all my problems. And I realized I did get the right go girl, and she did solve all. No, no. It is. <laughs> but I wondered, I wondered. I, I, is really, is God so archaic that sex before marriage, and he calls that sin? Like, does he not understand it? Really, do I have to be truthful all the time? Can I tell so-called white lies? Lies that we think benefit other people? That truly, do I have to give God my best and not my leftovers? Man, I had a form of Christianity. When it was Sunday morning to give, it's when I put my hand in my pocket and I really, oh, I had none. Oh, or next week I have $2. And that transfer, that was just symptomatic of my life. Where I pursued other things, my education, my goals in life, and secondarily, oh, but I wouldn't disregard God's plan for my life totally. And while it was not the last resort, it was certainly not seeking God's kingdom first. When I read scriptures that said, seek God and his kingdom first, I said, that, what a nice ideal. <laughs> when the scripture says I must love God more than I love any other relationship, including my spouse or my children, what? I went, I've read this Bible so many times I had never seen that in the context that I finally saw it. And I started to make decisions in my life that said, nobody lives like this. Why even try? But the idea is that God absolutely gives us tests in our life. And I challenge you here today, whatever you're grappling with, put a test before God. And see what He answers. But be faithful. I'm not talking about God being a benefit plan. We'll talk about that in a second, okay? But the idea here that these guys, and of course, what happens in this situation, 10 days later, they look healthier than the other people. And the, the king said, okay, all right, awesome. Your way wins. And so that was the first little battle. So we pick it up in Daniel chapter 3. In Daniel chapter 2, we know what happens, right? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Uh, he wanted someone to interpret the dream, and uh, the, his, his sage, his wise astrologer said to him, Hey, you tell us a dream, we'll interpret it for you. Nebuchadnezzar said, I was born at night, but not last night. <laughs> if you're truly wise people, you're going to not only know the interpretation of the dream, you are actually going to know the dream also.
He said, well, they, these guys said, oh, whoa, 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 good old Nebu. Nebby, 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 Nebby. Nobody can do that. And Daniel, of course, got wind and he interpreted the dream. And he was subsequently promoted. And then he took three young boys as well with him who became administrators in the province of Babylon. And now they had some responsibilities within Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the dream actually put him as a very powerful person. <laughs> he said, I like that. That's awesome. How great I art. And so he says he figured he can do anything he wants. And so we pick it up in chapter 3 and verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar had a golden statue made. It was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. I mean, you talk about absolute opulence. He says, man, I just... I want to be recognized. And people need to pay homage to me. And so he sent out summons to the entire land. He said, listen, everybody needs to come and they need to bow down to this image. Now, it's an interesting thing. I guess times haven't changed much because we still bow down to gold, don't we? Canada now has become one of the highest debt ratio in the world. Yes, even more than our southern friends. This pretense of living a life is not lost on us. The statistics bear it out. But if you were to talk to, oh, we have ads that says the universe needs more of Canada. And here, I'm here to tell you, I love this country. When I lived in the United States and and people were asking whether or not I would become a citizenship. And if it meant giving up the Canadian citizenship, I would not have done it. But that doesn't mean we don't recognize what is actually going on in our lives. And so things, <laughs> interestingly, in 3,000 years haven't changed much, has it? We still wonder if we're driving a nicer or newer car than our neighbor. Well, not the ring that I gave my fiance was better than the other person. Well, not I have a projection of my life. And bowing down to this God of gold has not changed at all. Just read. The top 26 people in this world, rich, that we know about, have more money than the 3.8 billion people. Put another way, if you were to divide that up, that's about 150 million people that one person has more money than on average in the top 26 in the world. It's stunning to me that we live in a world, can you imagine having one person having more money than everybody else living in Canada times five?
And yet we read and we hear about people saying after they've gotten a lot of money, man, I wish I didn't have much. And you know what you and I say? Give me the chance at least. I say it. I remember sitting down with a man who was worth about $170 million. And we're talking about our lives. And he says, Tony, I will gladly share places with you because this money has become a burden to me. I said, where do we sign over? <laughs> of course, I understand what he was talking about. And yet we leave God behind in the way we live or the words that he says and we still pursue it thinking I could do a better job than the other person and yet it has not changed in over 3,000 years. Do you know if evangelical Christians or to tithe for one year, we will end the world starvation problem. One year. Just in America and Canada. Listen, it's not an issue of resources. It's an issue of the heart. Resources? Are you insane? Do you see what we have around? We continue. And so he built this image and he says everybody needs to bow down to it. And we know the story. It says in verse 12, But there were Jewish men whom you appointed over administration of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men have not shown the proper respect to you, O king. They don't serve your gods. They don't pay homage to the golden statue that you have erected. You know that if you are really trying to live a Christian life, where you're at, there are challenges that are thrown your way all the time because of the stances that you make. Now, I will tell you that there are certain people who use Christianity as an excuse for bigotry and not loving. That's not what I'm talking about. And where that idea of standing up for something of euphemism for prejudice and looking down on people because they don't think like you or they don't act like you, or God forbid, they don't have the same skin color as you. That's not what I'm talking about. These guys were sought out because of their devotion to their God. And the people in Babylon did not like them. And so they wanted to trap them. They wanted to say, aha, we got you. Verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar in a fit of rage demanded that they bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before him. So they brought them before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and that you don't pay homage to the golden statue that I have erected? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the trigon, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, you must bow down and pay homage to the statue that I made, and if you don't pay homage to it, it, you will immediately be thrown into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Now, who is that God who can rescue you from my power? And so here comes a bigger test. What is your breaking point? What price is the value of your soul? 2013 BMW? 2017 Mercedes? I, I don't know the, the great neighborhoods yet, but let, let's pick one of those, okay, all right. A house there? Where? Right here? Okay, around this neighborhood, all right. <laughs> It's absolute crazy. 
These guys were being tested at a breaking point. At what point were they going to give up? At what point were they going to surrender their devotion to their God? Well, we know the outcome of the story, but let's read it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king Nebuchadnezzar, Oh, we do not need to give you a reply concerning this. If our God, whom we are serving, exists, he's able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will rescue us, O king, from your power as well. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we don't serve your gods, and we will not pay homage to the golden statue that you have erected. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage, and his disposition towards them changed. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times hotter than it was normally heated. We know the story of what happens, right? They were literally thrown into the fire, and their faith was literally on fire. And I know a crowd this size. I know that there are battles in your and my heart right now that you are grappling with. That you know, man, this is not the right thing. And, and, and I know what we're saying. We're saying this, man, let me just get through this time. And then I'm going to serve my God wholeheartedly. Is that Shadrach? What Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Hey, listen. Okay. I'm going to be prudent about this. <laughs> what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, but not in my heart, give in, but I'm going to say outwardly, because the heart is what counts, right? And so since I'm really not going to really subject myself to what is actually going on, I'm not really surrendering to the golden statue, but I'm doing it simply to save my life so it can be more effective later on, because I now have some administrative responsibilities in Babylon, and I can affect more people with my life, and... The rationalization goes on and on and on. The guys who were throwing him into uh, the furnace, it, the fire was so hot that they themselves were killed. And then it says in verse 24, the Nebuchadnezzar was startled and quickly got up. He said to his minister, wasn't it three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied to the king, oh, for sure, king. For shizzle. But I know. But I see these four men untied and walking around in the midst of the fire. No harm has come to them. And the appearance of the fourth is like that of a god. The Nebuchadnezzar approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He called out, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out. Come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego emerged from the fire. And the Bible tells us they did not even smell of fire. You know what's quite interesting here? The Bible tells us they were bound up when it went into the fire. And yet they were walking around in the fire. You know what that means? They're bound. They're t th that which shackled them were actually set free in the fire of God. The trials and the steadfastness of your faith is actually what will set you free and not imprison you. Satan tells you the exact opposite. I remember when I was studying the Bible and I was sharing my life and I was talking about my deceit and my impurity and my lust and my, uh, and my envy and my jealousy. I mean, you just name it. I, I didn't know why Andrea was laughing at she almost choked on her drink. Um, and I thought, man, if I really shared who I am, if I really sh expose my heart to these guys, if I really share what I'm like, are they going to think of me less? Somehow I had this idiotic thought that people really were thinking about me all the time. And yet when I was talking with my friend Clovis and I was sharing my life and in my heart it was going boop, 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 
boom, 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 boom. I was wondering. And then I opened my life and I realized, man, he embraced me even more and even tighter in my life. And I thought, wow, the lies of Satan that I thought if I really shared what's going on in my life, that people were not going to be as impressed with me as I thought. And the shackles really came loose. And as these men were thrown into the fire, do not buy into the lie of Satan that says, man, if I really pledge my life to God and give my life fully to Him, that somehow I am going to be shackled. I know there are some teens in this room who think, man, I don't want to give my life over to Christ because if I do, you know what's going to happen? I'm not going to be allowed to do a lot of things. That's a lie straight from the depths of hell. The only regret I have becoming a Christian at 19 is that I didn't become a Christian earlier. And don't, don't buy into the lies of Satan. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abigail said, Man, listen, this is not a benefit plan. Hey, I am not serving God because he's going to rescue me. By the way, even if he rescues me or he doesn't rescue me, I am not going to bow down. You know what he understood God to be? Not this, not this cosmic bellhop. I ring my bell and God just answers my prayer. God, I'm sick. Please help me get better. God, I need a job raise. God, you know I need a new car. God, I need more hair. God, I need to lose weight. Gotta need to be tanned. Ah, you know, you know what, you know. What Bible are we reading? What Bible are we reading? You really think that's what God is for? God, I'm going to the Gulf Range and I need help me to hit a straighter. Oh, you can fill in the gaps. And we close with this. Nebuchadnezzar ex exclaimed as we're going to be heading into our time here for communion in a few minutes. Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent forth his angel and has rescued his servants and trusted in him, ignoring the edict of the king and giving up their bodies rather than serve or pay homage to any god other than their god. I hereby decree that any people nation or language or group that blasphemes the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be dismembered and his home reduced to rubble. I don't think good old Nebi got the point. He said, okay, this is the real God, so guys, okay, we're going to kill people if they don't work. That's not who God is. If you ever, Nebuchadnezzar, what, what's wrong with you, man? Listen, if someone doesn't go and believe the scriptures as we do, we don't wish evil on them. We don't try to dismember them. Nebuchadnezzar thought, man, we're going to do it by the sword. We're going to do it by power. We're going to have an edict. Just like I had the other edict, we're going to have another edict. I didn't quite get it, but that's all right. He was trying. Nebuchadnezzar realized, he says, man, these guys were willing to give their bodies instead of giving up their faith. How about you? How about me? There are concepts like this in the scriptures all the time. God says, hey, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Your left hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 1 Peter chapter 1, as the brothers and sisters are helping us and preparing for the communion. In verse 3 it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is, into an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It is reserved in heaven for you, who by God's power are protected through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This brings you great joy. Although you may have had to suffer for a short, short time in various trials, such trials pr show the proven character of your faith, which is much more valuable than gold. Huh, interesting. 
gold that is tested by fire, and even though it is passing away and will bring praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ will be revealed. You've not seen him, but you love him. You do not see him now, but you believe in him, and so rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy because you are attaining the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See what he's talking about? He says this reference to fire and gold, right? He says, listen, gold, even gold needs to be refined. And Nebuchadnezzar, it was not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who needed to be thrown into the fire. It was your statue that needed to be gold thrown into the fire to be refined. And so there are references to, you know, when you read the scripture, you realize it's so intertwined. It says, listen, this faith, it's imperishable. This joy is indescribable. And so this morning, if you're visiting with us, or even if you've been coming for a while, and why do we sing like our hands is in the air and we're just like mad people? Because we have an indescribable and glorious joy because we know what awaits us, not because of what we have done, God forbid, but what he has done. And so today, our faith on fire. Trust me, it allows you to lose the imprisonment and the shackles of your life. Let us pray and give thanks to Christ. God, we're so grateful that you have allowed us to be refined through trials and fire because our faith is, faith is worth much more than gold. Father, we know that there are times that we fall short and Father, we succumb to the trappings of the world. Help us, Father. Strengthen our arms. Strengthen our knees so that we don't bow down. Allow our knees to be rehabbed in a way that it stands strong even in this snow. And we do not slip. Or even if we slip, Father, we get up again. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his death because it meant life for us. Father, as we take these emblems that symbol by, sim, uh, symbolizes your body and the blood that was shed for us, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.